So again, I think this is the third time I am confronting the peril of speaking after Susie. <laughs> and I must say that on this occasion, she has left very little for me to, to add. Uh, she knows my perspective, my take on this, which is that the default has to be freedom of expression. That is the objective of all of this. And even as we discuss uh, violations of this precious freedom by people who are entrusted with delivering messages, we need to bear in mind that the end product has to be more freedom rather than less freedom. The ironic part about this is that this most promising platform for freedom of expression has become its greatest threat. Freedom of expression has never been challenged as it has been as it is today. It is not that any of this is new though, because as we heard in previous presentations, Paul is here, Susie yourself cited um, instances, Kiran. You know, none of this is actually new. And we can probably trace its origins. Um, Kiran starts at 44 BC, um, but I think um, from the very birth of human civilization, um, we don't want to talk about a snake necessarily. <laughs> but, you know, the stories of, of false information in order to achieve undesirable results this, this has always been with us, but we have never been in a situation in which false, falsehoods, misinformation, disinformation could be so efficiently distributed. So those of us who have an interest in allowing all points, and all perspectives to prevail, um, continue to look forward to a situation in which these new marvels can produce more expression along much freer lines. It is being jeopardized and threatened by these new developments um, that are technologically led, but at the same time governed by a, a mindset that is essentially destructive. Because um, the end product of this information can only be d destruction. And if we only focus on the destruction of truth, we know that how dangerous and, and inimical it is. Determining what we should do about it, that's a highly problematic area. Particularly if you have an interest in ensuring that the channels for communication remain as unfettered as possible, so people with new, even contentious ideas can enter this space on equal terms with everybody else. How to achieve that, I think, Nobody has the answer. The human rights community with which I um, align myself very closely has been battling this issue and there's quite a lot of contention even in the human rights community about how best to proceed with this. Um, whether we attempt to employ um, law and, and penalties associated with law or whether we approach this thing by taking a clinical look at the processes and try and attempt to stem the misinformation process along the way. We can probably identify three distinct functions um, to, to examine if we have to adopt this line of attack. We tend to focus quite a lot on the supply side, on the production of the misinformation and who is product, producing this misinformation and what are the messages. That's on the supply side. And the legislative uh, suggestions, the suggestions for laws, basically focus almost exclusively on the suppliers because these are the people who are producing the false messages in order to achieve undesirable effects. But there are other processes at play as well. You have the demand side, and I'm going to come back to the demand side, which is your audiences, your con the consumers of this information. But a very important component that is becoming increasingly problematic uh, is the, that 
intermediate level of distribution and who and what mediates in communicate in all communication studies you just you looked at the mediation of content and at different points in the communication of a message there are mediation activities that would occur such that you can accelerate the messaging you can slow it down you can change its character the mediation tools that we look at these is are essentially the online platforms this is in this sphere of, of it and those that has become particularly problematic because they're so pervasive and so ubiquitous and so difficult to track down that quite frankly people um, really don't know how to address it now we can at the drop of our hat recognize who the big tech players are that provide the platforms and provide the major channels but that's only part of the story and the presentation i made yesterday i think it was i mentioned a lot of the new players and the quote unquote small tech operators and it, it might be found that they are among the more problematic because the big tech there are countries that are attempting to bring them to, to book and to make them more accountable through the application of laws, through, um, through new measures that they can directly attend because these big tech operators have corporate personality. So you know who they are, you know who is the CEO, you know who is the chairman, you know um, the people who are pretty much doing the operations behind them. I think that more focus needs to be paid by the, the global community on that component. The supply side is highly problematic and perhaps will always be with us. And as, as we have been discussing, uh, you know, um, Susie and I in, in directly and indirectly at each other, um, we can, there already exists uh, a legal framework or there exist legal frameworks address issues as outright defamation, hate speech, and other uh, breaches of things that are totally acceptable even within the human rights space. But how do we address this amorphous thing that's upon us like a, like a, a heavy blanket? We, what, we are, what, are we, what we are dealing with is also not, not a linear process and we've known this in communication studies for years that even the basic communication is not a linear process of, of okay I am standing here and I am injecting a message in the Quran there, there was a hypodermic theory um, which Paul would know about, of course the, this belief that okay you, you insert messages in this hypodermic needle and the administrator the supplier of this would be injecting it and it goes directly into your veins and starts to infect you. And we learned that it just don't work that way. If it used to work that way, this particular issue would be much easier to address. It just doesn't work that way. We're not talking about a hypodermic needle. We're talking about an amorphous process that is extremely difficult to put our fingers on. So people involved in bringing order to our societies are finding it extremely difficult to address um, and hence the resort to, to the defaults of prohibition for example um, and that's why I say that we need to maintain a freedom of expression perspective on this because the answer should not be prohibition or more prohibition I think that the answer resides in, in the, on those two main areas of the mediation what happens in the middle, the platform and the conduit, and what happens at the end in terms of the demand or the consumers. And Susie ended her uh, remarks by referring, for example, to digital literacy. What, what promotion of digital literacy, which is a sort of subset of broader media and information literacy, what that does is that it, it seeks to create audiences that are more critical in their reception of, of this material that's coming our way. Because I think that the, the particularly the, the rate at which the technologies are developing, it's going to be near impossible to try to 
tame that, to tame it at that level. So it's more a matter now of ensuring that when these messages reach, that you're they're, they're, they're reaching audiences that are discerning, that are applying a high level of critical thinking. But even so, I'm not saying that we ignore the perpetrators in, in any way. I think that, that there is enough law and, and that, that the laws are evolving in such a way. I raised the issue yesterday about um, jurisdiction because it's, it's, it's now virtually accepted that at the point of reception of, the, of fake information, false information, the, this thing can be actionable at the point of, of, it, of its distribution. So uh, uh, a defamation against anybody in here that reaches um, Trinidad and Tobago can be prosecuted in the Trinidad and Tobago jurisdiction if you feel that um, the Curacao framework is inadequate to address your needs. Now that is not sufficient because by that time a lot of damage has already been done. So that remains um, problematic. So we're dealing with the speed of the communication, its ubiquity. Um, what we're dealing with now is also with a lot of intangibles. How, how do you legislate or tame an algorithm, which is a sort of mechanical function? Now artificial intelligence, which is, which is fast, which is efficient in its own way, and which is highly flawed, as we, as we found. I was telling people that I searched, I very vainly looked up my own name on ChatGBT. And in four different searches, I got four different versions of me. <laughs> um, each one with untruths. Information that's just blatantly untrue. Now, that was not Kiran trying to defame me or trying to say bad things about me or, in some cases, very good things about me that are not true. That's an algorithm. That's a, that's a mechanical function organized and arranged by um, computer coding or whatever it is goes into um, these uh, to AI, um, AI um, instruments. So that, that it's extremely, extreme. I, I keep saying, and, and it's, only, it's only because this is a UNESCO hosted event, that the ultimate solution, given all, maybe there are things that might happen between now and, and, and next week or next year or 10 years from now, that will convince me otherwise, but that the, the, the solution at this stage has to be focused on creating audiences that are, who are more discerning and apply a greater level of, of oh, that's not going to happen overnight, unfortunately. Quite a lot of damage is going to be sustained along the way. And I think that to the full extent that exists in law, um, because the thing is that we don't want to start moving too much uh, I, 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 I can speak freely about the Caribbean experience here because there, there are governments, if you allow too much leeway, uh, even though you might be supportive of it you, and, and assume good intentions, the good intentions don't always prevail. So you make the punishments more, you, you make the punishments ha harsher, and you make the penalties um, more difficult for them to... to um, negotiate and it's it can can and will be used against you in, in, in the end the thing about about the fake messaging and and, and and propaganda generally and as i said it's nothing new we all know well we know now we know through kiran bc44 but we all know during the second world war for example the use of prop war time propaganda and we everybody talks about Goebbels and, and and the nazi regime and so on but propaganda is widely used by all of the other combatants. You know, uh, my son, who is a, a filmmaker and has studied film, would tell you that the propaganda videos um, produced by um, the Allies at the time, um, if you look at them now, they, they, they would be quite hilarious, knowing what we know about how the war went. And quite a, it's very skillfully done, and with a focus on basically misleading people into believing that at times they were winning when they were in fact under heavy pressure. Now we're dealing with something that's addressing the subconscious, but in a, in a, in a different kind of way. Because it's, it's reaching you faster. Nobody is sitting in a studio compiling 
and uh, assimilating the information, the false information that's re reaching you. It's happening faster and it's happening in a very targeted manner. In the same way that the algorithms uh, make the ads pop up in, on your social media accounts and even in your, in your emails, it's, just, it's the same process that goes into the dissemination of, of false information that can be potentially harmless, harmful. The accent is on immediacy. And we, the, the way um, the, the, our cultural evolution now is calling more and more for immediate access to information. You want it now. You know, so um, Susie was speaking a little while ago and I was um, looking up some of the things that she said because I want to know what, I'm not going to wait until I get back to the hotel to Google that. You know, I am checking constantly, and, and I don't know. I'll be amazed if my son isn't right now fact checking me. <laughs> because it's, we are capable of doing that. And, but if we are at the level of understanding what we are dealing with, we would ourselves apply the same um, way, the same approach. Now, a lot of it, a lot of it, I would say, is unwitting misinformation that's in, innocently propagated by people who think that they're doing something good. So nobody wants to see school violence. And somebody comes across, somebody sends this video and they say, hey, look what happened in the school yesterday, in Curacao, when it's Trinidad and Tobago, and it's becoming an, a, almost a daily occurrence now, the violence in the schools, and really very serious violence. Um, and that, that's not because a person is a bad person or, or means, doesn't mean well. The, all of the best intentions but because of uh, the absence of, of checking, and Susie identified some of the, the methodologies that you can employ for fact checking. Um, at the MIC, we have been focusing very heavily on the online and other means that can be employed by journalists, because journalists are falling into the trap too. A lot of the sources of immediate news, the breaking news that media uh, are preoccupied with nowadays, it's coming through social media and there's a strong obligation on, on the part of journalists now to be able to to dispel um, untruths so that we are able be able now to track video so that video for example there's soft online software that you can use to 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 track the, the date of the video where it originated from and things like that we all probably now use reverse imaging through Google there's also another platform, ironically enough, developed by the, by the Russians, which has proven to be extremely useful. In fact, I was really surprised um, two weeks ago, um, hearing from one of the US-based experts in this thing, who has no reason to be supportive of Russia on anything, um, suggesting that we make use of the, the reverse imaging. I can't remember the name of the site, Kiran, but um, it, it's far more efficient than Google Image Search. And maybe for the wrong reasons, the, the, the Russians are accumulating a vast um, accumulation library of images, of global images, for good or bad reasons. But the fact of the matter is that their bank, their data bank with images is, is far more extensive than any of the others. So when you, when you use your, your search, your reverse image, they, they come up with far better results than, than Google. And Google does the same thing, by the way. Um, so we have to we have to use the, the new methods. We have to fight this thing on its own turf. I said it is a, a threat to freedom of expression. Also a threat, threat to if you look at how social media combatants are, are using their social in order to reinforce their cre their credibility, which is usually based on nothing. They are deliberate attempts to undermine. The existing mainstream media and to to project the mainstream media as itself guilty of the same transgressions that they thrive on and so I mean you, you are, Susie, again you, in terms of the building awareness in the pub in the public eye you will know that the mainstream media they have a they have an identity they have a name they're incorporated by law in some instances, they need to be registered with some government office. 
you know who the editor-in-chief is you have a good idea who the reporters are so if you want to go for them you could go for them whether or not you consider the, the, um, the, the legal framework to be inadequate <laughs> but the thing is that dealing with these these other players who are attempting to gain primacy in the, the, the in this battle for eyes and ears and attention it's far more difficult and discerning audiences should bear things like that in mind and some of the advice you gave a little while ago is good it's very appropriate so make no words about it fake news misinformation even a certain amount of disinformation is the responsibility of mainstream media but the vast majority of it most of it i would say comes from these shadowy anonymous operators working in the virtual space some of them with good intentions so they're trying to show the rest of the population that um, bill gates wants to take over the world um, i put on on my social media the other day hey do, don't you realize that the who has announced the end of the emergency public emergency status of COVID-19 did you realize that all of this happened and Bill Gates is not yet in power he hasn't taken over the world um, and so, so people the, the people who are uh, who read some of them would understand what I'm talking about I'm talking about them and the way they have approached this the whole matter of the, of the pandemic I have some other point but I think Susie made a you know out, outline this thing extremely well um, I thought that, especially towards the end where you were offering the prescriptions, that something should be written somewhere and be used in the public awareness um, programs here in Curacao and in the rest of the Caribbean as, as guidance in terms of how audiences, how consumers of this can better manage the information that they come across. We in the media, we also need to be part of that media and information literacy and digital literacy. At the MIC, we have been making efforts to ensure that the journalists, that in their daily, they are not fooled by all of this nonsense. They don't become part of it. They don't become um, part of that chain, that distribution chain for misinformation and disinformation. So that's about the most that I can say because, again, um, yet again, I'm, I'm following somebody who has, uh, you know, a really sound grasp of the issues and who is both descriptive. And, and just as strongly prescriptive in her presentations. I want to thank you very much for making my work much easier this evening, Susie. Thank you.